All right, now, what I'm supposed to do, I'm supposed to talk to you about becoming revolutionaries. I'm supposed to talk to you about becoming change agents. I'm supposed to talk to you about how to create this amazing revolution in higher education. That is what I've been tasked to do. But if I can be honest with you, I don't really feel like doing that. <laughs> um, and I don't feel like doing that because to talk about revolution is to assume that we have mastered and conquered all of the things that hold us back. And the number one thing that holds us back or holds us back is fear. So before we can talk about becoming revolutionaries, we have to conquer our fear. So if it's OK with you, what I'd like to talk to you about is fear. Is that OK? Yeah. Some of you might look at me and think, what do you really know about fear? Right? I mean, you're a big guy. You're, you're an athlete. You've done lots of stuff. What do you really, really know about fear? And to be honest with you, I didn't really know a hell of a whole lot about fear. Right? I didn't live my life from a place of fear. I typically assume whatever it was that I wanted to do, I would succeed. Whatever issues were in my way, I would just run them over or I would outthink them. I was not very familiar with fear until I took the job as president of Paul Quinn College. And my path to the presidency is one that is very, very difficult to replicate because I just got a phone call one day driving down a highway. And I was part of a group that was negotiating to buy an NBA franchise. And the chair of the board at Paul Quinn called me up and said, hey, how would you like to be president? That's a very unusual search firm, by the way. <laughs> and I said, you know, we're buying a basketball team. I'm moving to Memphis. I'm going to get to be president of the franchise. So thank you, but I don't know what you're going to pay me, <laughs> but they're going to pay me more. Right? And, and I said, you know, why, why are you even calling me? I mean, I, I didn't apply for the job. And, and that's something else that I would encourage you to keep in mind. When people call you to offer you a job that you didn't apply for, there's a catch. <laughs> All right. Now, you might be a, one of those handful of people that think they're offering you a job just because you're amazing and people drive around thinking, God, we should hire you. If you're that person, you are crazy. <laughs> All right. Chances are, if people offer you a job you didn't apply for, it's because nobody wanted it. That's how I became president of Paul Quinn. And what I didn't know at the time was just how much trouble the institution was in. We had 30 days of cash on hand. <laughs> By the way, always ask to see the books before you take a job. Um, I did not, OK. But we had 30 days of cash left. Um, everything was broken. and. We were a failing institution. We were easily one of the worst institutions in the country. Um, our creditor tried to kick us out. Um, it, it, was, it was rough. And I get there, and I find out we, are, we have a year to a year and a half before we will go out of business if we don't make radical changes. So every day I go home thinking, Paul Quinn College is 135 years old. It survived Reconstruction. It survived the Depression. It survived Jim Crow. But it might not survive Mike Sorrell. And it was going to be a very public failing. And it was scary. And every day, I lived with that reality, that cloud hanging over my head. It forced me to work 18-hour days, seven days a week, for a year and a half, until one morning I woke up in a hospital. And everyone who I knew and loved was looking down at me. And they take the breathing machine off of me, and they bring me out of, um, out of the medical-induced coma. And they say to me, 
you survived a sudden cardiac, well actually they didn't tell me this at the time, they just said I had a cardiac episode. And I'm like, I had a heart attack? And they said, no, it was a cardiac episode. <laughs> and I'm like, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> All right? Turns out I suffered something called sudden cardiac death. And I had a 2% chance of living. All right? So I should not have lived. And I literally was so afraid of failure that I killed myself. Fear took me to a place where I was in a hospital having to be resuscitated. At that moment, when I came to, and I could begin to wrap my mind around what happened, I realized something. We were going to win at Paul Quinn College. And I realized we were going to win because the Lord doesn't save you to humiliate you. That's not how faith works. Now, I know maybe two Bible passages, but I'm a man of deep faith. And at the moment when you survive a near-death experience, it changes you. It fundamentally changes you. Because what I realized was fear has no place in our lives. Fear cannot be the thing that drives us, that keeps us, that holds us back that prevents us from doing what our heart, what our minds, what our passion, what the people we love the most would have us do. And at that moment, I let go of being afraid of failure, and I decided that we were going to win. I didn't always know how we were going to win, but I knew that we were going to win. And so for the remaining time that we have together tonight, the gift that I can give you is to teach you how to defeat your fear without having to wake up on a hospital bed and be scared or shocked into conquering your fear. So what we're going to do today, we're going to talk about the three steps to conquering your fear. Step number one, if you really want to let go of your fear, if you really want to stop being a portion of who you can be, you have to lead with love. You have to find something in your life. You have to find something in your life that really emotionally matters to you. Something that wakes you up in the morning, something that sends you to bed at night, something that you can pour your heart and your soul into. You have to find that. I did not always have that. I led from a place of rage. I led from a place of anger, a place where I didn't like people who doubted me. I didn't like people who dismissed me. I didn't like being dismissed because of the color of my skin. I didn't like being dismissed because of my size. I did not like that. I channeled that into rage. Rage drove me. Rage sent me to a hospital bed. So I changed. I changed to someone who learned to lead with love. Now, I didn't get there easily. I was a mess as a young college president. I was all over the place. One day I got into a fight with a male student on my campus. Like we were yelling at each other, cussing each other out. I mean, let's be honest, you know you cuss, okay, <laughs> all right? And he comes in my office, we're yelling and screaming, he breaks down in tears. I don't know what to do with that because I'm from Chicago. Right? You, you're a brother who cries in Chicago, you will get killed. Okay? So I just like, Psh. Well, Luckily, I had a staff member there with me. She cared for him. She took him out of the room. And then she turned her attention on me. And she was an older staff member. She was a quintessential Southern mother. And she looked at me and she said, baby, I met your mother, and your mother was tough on you, but you have never lived one moment of your life wondering if you were loved. She said, in fact, you bear all the signs of being overloved. <laughs> I'm like, did you just throw some shade at me, right? Did you just talk about my mama? <laughs> right? 
And she changed me. She said, I know you love our students, but if you want them to know you love them, you're going to have to lead with love. Saved me. Saved me as a man, saved me as a president, and put me in touch with a side of myself that, frankly, has made me so much better and happier as a person. So our first step is we're going to learn to lead with love. At Paul Quinn College, we do that with our institutional ethos of we over me. The needs of a community supersede the wants of an individual. At Paul Quinn College, you don't get to be selfish. You have to pour yourself into the work. We turn the institution outward so we can address the needs of the communities we serve from a place of love. You all are serving a population of students that needs you to love them. And I'm not talking about creepy love, OK? Let me just be clear, because some of y'all are like, oh, yeah, right? No, I'm talking about authentic love. The love you feel when you are selfless. The love you feel when you are dedicating your soul to the work. That is important. Here's one example of how we did that. We used to have a football team. You might have heard of it. No, you didn't hear of it, because they lost every game, right? We terminated the football. The first act I did as a college president was I terminated the football program, right? Football team got a little mad. Let's be honest, right? The community surrounding the college was in a food desert. And no one helped us. They'd been a food desert for over 20 years. So we turned our football field into a farm so that we could feed the people in the community. For the last, since 2010, we have grown more than 50,000 pounds of food. We give away 10% of everything we grow. We call it tithing to the community. We have inspired the, or guilted the city into opening up a grocery store across the street from the campus. So our small college ended a food desert, right? Thank you. That's an example of leading with love. James and Darcia run our farm. This summer, they started a food a farmer's market, which is fantastic. Second example of how you conquer your fear, get in the arena. Get in the arena. Teddy Roosevelt gave an amazing speech. Man in the arena is fantastic. I encourage you to read it. But here's what I want you to know about getting in the arena. It means you find the fight that is worth fighting, and you get after it. At Paul Quinn College, we have decided to dedicate our entire institution, our existence, to one goal. We're going to end poverty. We're going to use higher education and all the tools at our disposal to address poverty and to end poverty. That is the arena we have decided to get in. We welcome you to join that arena, but find the one that you're most passionate about. But understand this, that Poverty in today's environment has to be addressed. For the first time in our country's history, over 50% of the students in K through 12 are living free and reduced lunch lives. 50% of the, over 50% of the students in college today are on Pell Grants. 45 million Americans are living in poverty. The problem is the people who could do something about this have chosen not to. Billionaires made so much money last year, they could end extreme poverty seven times. And they are sitting on the sidelines. They're using their money to fund, I'm sorry, I realize I'm in the South, so I'm not going to go political, but they are funding things that aren't in everyone's best interest. We'll just say it that way, OK? This is in everyone's best interest. We have a responsibility to end poverty. Number three. Your next must be greater than your now. The third way to conquer your fear is to realize you are living for something. You have a purpose. That purpose carries you forward. Your next must be better than your now. This is Asia Morell. She is a freshman at Paul Quinn College. She's from Memphis, Tennessee. I love this picture because the look on her face says it all. Her tomorrow is filled with hope. Here's how we deliver hope at Paul Quinn College. We turned our institution into the first urban work college in the country. 
and we built an academic model called reality-based education. And reality-based education is this, three legs. Number one, experiential learning. The work program allows students to take what they are learning in the classroom and apply it immediately in their jobs. All of our students who live on campus work between 10 to 15 hours a week. Some work on campus, others work off campus. It allowed us to cut over $10,000 out of tuition and fees and create a pathway for our students to graduate owing less than $10,000 when they graduate from college. That's important because some people will tell you that the way out of poverty is education. I don't claim to be a genius, but I think the way out of poverty is with money. Okay? So we're going to help our students pay less money back for the rest of their lives. Number two, we believe in project-based learning infused with entrepreneurial thought and action. All right? So in our classes, all of our students are required to do group projects, and the group projects, the subject of them, are problems from their lives. So we are encouraging the students to solve the problems of their own lives. Imagine if you sat in class and someone gave you the ability to actually apply what you're learning for the things you cared the most about. That might make the difference of it all. So that is what we are doing, project-based learning infused with entrepreneurial thought and action. We think it's everything. The third leg, though, is what we've chosen to do with the liberal arts. Everybody bashes the liberal arts. We decided the liberal arts are still good. They just need to be freshened up a little bit, right? I mean, they've been the same thing for hundreds and hundreds of years. Maybe we should make them relevant to today's society. So we asked some employers, what do you care most about? What do people need to do to be successful? They said, one, they need to be able to write. Students, our employees need to be able to speak. They need to be able to think critically. And they need to have technology-based understanding. So we said, sounds like there's room for a new version of the liberal arts. Now, we brand everything at Paul Quinn College. So we see your liberal arts. We just got rid of them. We're now the Quinnite arts, OK? So when you go back to your school and you talk about liberal arts learning, you're really talking about the Quinnite arts. <laughs> all right? Just, just give us a nod. We understand, <laughs> all right? So here's what we're doing. Every class now requires you to write. So each class requires students to write. It's called writing across the curriculum. That is based off of the traditional liberal arts version called grammar, all right? Number two, if you have to be able to speak, how about we require every student to speak in each class? So each class now requires students to stand up and give a presentation so that they become comfortable presenting their ideas. That's called speaking across the curriculum. Number three, reasoning across the curriculum teaching the students to think critically and solve problems by engaging with the subject matter in a critical fashion. That's the old time liberal arts version of reasoning. All right, so now each class requires you to do that. Lastly, we are in the technology age. So maybe we should teach the students how to master technology. And that's not Snapchat. That's not Twitter. That just because you can text doesn't mean that you have built digital mastery. So now, starting next fall, all of our classes will require the students to demonstrate digital mastery and to build digital mastery. Now, obviously, that wasn't part of the original liberal arts because there was no technology back then, all right? But there is now. Writing across the curriculum, speaking across the curriculum, thinking critically across the curriculum, and building digital mastery across the curriculum. When you marry that with project-based learning, and when you marry that with experiential learning, you now have an era of education that speaks to the needs of the students who are here today. You have the ability to address the things that are causing financial instability in their lives. You can break the cycle of poverty because we are here to end poverty. Paul Quinn College is expanding, all right? We are going to open up campuses in different cities. We are forming a consortium with some of the universities that are here right now. 
This is where we are headed because we understand this. We understand how important it is, and we encourage you to embrace it as well. But even as we conquer our fear, even as we understand those three steps that it's going to take for you to defeat your fear, you have to remember, and you have to keep this at the base of your soul. This has nothing to do with you. You are not conquering your fear for yourselves. You're not conquering your fear because it's going to get you a better job. You're not conquering your fear because it's going to turn you into a public intellectual. You are conquering your fear because it's about your students. It's about their lives. Listen, I want you to be bold. I want you to be daring. I want you to be strong. I want you to be a revolutionary, but not for the sake of being daring, not for just the sake of being bold, not just because it's cool to be a revolutionary. I want you to do it because you understand that more than anything else, we have an obligation to those who have entrusted us with their futures. They are coming from families where this is the only dream that they have, the dream of a better tomorrow, the dream that their next will be better than their now. That is what we are here for, at least that is what we should be here for. And if you are really here for that, if you have come for that true purpose, if this is your truest and best version of yourself, if this is where you stand on the shoulders of giants so you can be tall, if this is what you believe in, then your fear will dissipate. I have not been afraid since I woke up that morning. And my job hasn't gotten easier. And there have been difficult times. There continue to be difficult times. But my soul no longer belongs to me. It belongs to my students. It belongs to a community that I have chosen to serve. And every day when I step out and I serve them with the most authentic place that I can come from, with the most, the most bountiful amount of love that I can possess, I don't feel fear. I feel joy. I feel gratitude for being able to do the work that they have allowed me to do. And so for the time together that we have had, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for being open to the idea that you can face your fears. Thank you for being open to the idea that you can dream a bigger dream. Thank you for being open to the possibility of revolutionary action and revolutionary dreams because you understand that fear has no place in your life. Let go of your fear and watch what happens next. Thank you.